Guinea's junta rules out exile for ousted President Alpha Conde. Hong Kong voters cast their ballots for their first elections and the new amendments for patriotic governance. And Egypt in talks with Moderna to produce COVID-19 jabs locally. This is Africa Live. Hello and welcome to the show. I am Penny Nakaribe. Also coming up this hour. In business, Ghana signs a $1.2 billion deal to develop its bauxite resources. And in sport, African 100 meters record tumble at World Athletics Tour in Nairobi. We begin in Guinea, where junta leader Lieutenant Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya has held a press conference addressing issues raised by the Economic Community of West African States, also known as ECOWAS. ECOWAS demanded for the release of deposed President Alpha Conde. The bloc is also urging for the return of constitutional order in Guinea. Sujitian Wanja Mungai reports. A day after ECOWAS representatives left Conakry, the military junta briefed the media about its response to the regional bloc's demands. Colonel Amara Kamara, the spokesperson of the newly formed Guinea National Rally and Development Committee, spoke on some of the pressing points. They include ECOWAS' call for the release of Alpha Conde, who has been in custody since his government was overthrown on 5th of September. It is clear to all the parties that the former president will remain in Guinea and at the location chosen by the CNRD. However, all measures will be taken to respect his physical and moral integrity. Alpha Conde is in a safe place and benefits from all the treatment due to his rank. Spokesperson Kamara told the journalists that plans are underway to have Guinea back under constitutional rule. ECOWAS had insisted on a six-month transition to a civilian administration. The President of the Republic, Mamadou Dumbuya, reminded his hosts that it was important for ECOWAS to listen to the legitimate aspirations of the people of Guinea. He insisted on not making the mistakes of the past. To avoid these mistakes, he informed the ECOWAS delegation that the national consultations had begun and that only the sovereign people of Guinea would decide their destiny. The military junta says it will not be affected by the announced ECOWAS sanctions, including a freeze of its leaders' assets and a travel ban. The president responded by saying that we in the CNRD are soldiers and that our action took place on Guinean soil. We do not need to travel and there is nothing to freeze in our bank accounts. ECOWAS leaders had earlier met the junta, Ghanaian President Nana Akufo Addo and Ivorian President Alassane Ouattara had said the discussions were fruitful. Wanja Mungai, CGTN. Let's cross now to our correspondent, Desiree Cannon, in Conakry for the latest. Uh, Desiree, talk to us about the CNRD national consultations that began last Tuesday. When will they end and what groups of people remain to be met? Uh, Pelina, it should be uh, noted that uh, the Guinean's uh, coup leaders have already uh, held talks with uh, the country's political uh, parties, the religious leaders, the head of uh, Guinean's mining companies, the uh, regional coordinations, the banking sector, the civil society, as well as uh, many uh, figures. So the consultation will uh, uh, start uh, we will continue next week. So on Monday, Dumbia and his uh, uh, staff will meet with uh, uh, cultural actors as well as, as, well as uh, uh, the media groups and end uh, the consultation on uh, Tuesday with the informal sector. Desiree, the CNRD ruling council designated Dumbuya as president of the Republican head of state. How are Guineans reacting to this? Well, uh, uh, Pelida, it is important to mention that uh, a lot of people here in Guinea have put their trust in uh, uh, Dumbuya, who overthrew uh, President Alpha Conde. Uh, most of people, uh, most of Guinean here say that uh, Dumbia is the right person to 
put uh, Guinea uh, back on the right track. Uh, it is therefore with uh, a great joy that uh, they learned of uh, the nomination of Dumbia as the head of a country. It is uh, also important to mention that uh, Guinean people themselves are in favor of uh, a transition of eight months and not uh, the transition of six months as imposed by ECOWAS. All right, Desiree, thank you for that update. Desiree Cannon live for us in Conakry. Let's widen this conversation. We're joined by Wale Ojewale, the Regional Organized Crime Observatory Coordinator for Central Africa at the Institute for Security Studies. He joins us from Dakar. Thank you very much, Wale, for joining us. Now, with the current stalemate between Guinea and ECOWAS, what are the other options on the table for ECOWAS? Well, thank you so much. The option for the ECOWAS is very, very clear. And it is to explore every possibility that they can to ensure that democratic transition is um, uh, embarked upon immediately. And I think the first thing which the president of Nigeria has actually I mean, spoken about is the fact that there might be the need to um, activate the Article 45 protocol of ECOWAS on democratic governance. And that implies that um, um, not recognizing the election that brought Apakonde in with the legitimacy crisis that trade it, and conduct and support the democratic institution within the country, working with AU, UN, to ensure that there is prompt election that takes place in the country. And the starting point is probably to put, on, put up a transition government in place that is going to spearhead that within the next six months. That is the option. Right. So we've also noticed, uh, Wally, that France has remained very muted in all of this, which is really out of character for the country. It gets very involved in, its, in, in affairs of its former French colonies. What's your reading of this silence? Well, I think it's a two-way thing. You know that France um, has been very, very strong in terms of political leaning um, of Francophone African countries. So it gets everybody worrisome, like you have said. And I think probably France is just trying to read the, the, I mean, read the situation and intervene as appropriate. But I'm very, very optimistic that France is going to support a democratic process within the country. And then when, um, I think um, the ECOWAS should play the lead role here and not really be too concerned about what role France is going to play on the long run because this is our own continent and this is our own region. And the primary responsibility for democratic restoration and sustenance actually lies with uh, with ECOWAS. So I think we should fear, we should worry less about the position of France in this and just uh, concentrate on how ECOWAS is going to provide the lead. Watara has gone there. The president of Ghana has gone there. And I think um, uh, going by what has happened in Mali and the role that uh, ECOWAS is playing, we are also going to get a positive response from Guinea on, in this regard. Well, you did mention Mali, and you just took the words out of my mouth, Wale. Events in Guinea resulting in the ousting of President Alpha Conde. These are just the latest examples of the army intervening in national politics. It started in Zimbabwe. We saw an attempted one in Niger. In Mali, it's happened twice. Now we're talking about Guinea. It almost appears as if military interventions are occurring more often on the continent. Is this an, what is this an indicator of? What's going on? I think it's an indicator of two things. One, it is the legitimacy deficit that is hanging on some of this president. Um, uh, you, for instance, in the case of Guinea, the, the, the president actually subverted the constitutional process by uh, vying for the position of the president for the third time. And that was not uh, well received by the people, the Guineans. And the second thing is the democratic government that is actually not delivering good governance to the people. I think that is what is making, uh, uh, that, is, that is what is calling for the alluring of the military rule. But by historical experience and antecedents, I think those are the forefront of that that you saw jubilating on the street. Probably they are children of recent history who didn't know what, what military would look like in some of this country. So I think it's a mix of historical uh, knowledge and then democrat uh, the poor democratic governance and legitimacy deficit that is uh, actually affecting some of this country and is making military uh, rule to look ap uh, appealing to some of them. But um, in the recent of it, I believe um, um, military rule is not going to take uh, a, a, a second uh, 
old on the continent, particularly in the region which has been described as um, a region that is actually opening up to democracy. So I think we should fear less. ECOWAS is on top of the game, and we're going to see positive response. ECOWAS is not going to tolerate military rule within West African sub-region. All right. Wale Ojowale in Dakar, thank you very much for those insights. Authorities in the Afghan capital have spoken to the press about efforts to get the city back up and running. The mayor of Kabul said the government has been gradually carrying out its municipal duties and it's working on six major issues. Zmarilai Abbasin tells us more. Well, uh, the Kabul mayor, Maulavi uh, Hamdullah, came to the press conference for the first time after his appointment he, and he talked about six major issues, including the is a rapation of the lands in, uh, in Kabul and also the revenue of Kabul municipality, the cleansing issues and also those illegal uh, construction in buildings or, uh, or the major issues issue since last 20 years. And according to Kabul Meyer, they will all, uh, all uh, solve the issues and uh, everything needs much more concentration because the judicial system is not yet normalized and after it's normalized they will go after all those uh, are involved in land grabbing or the usurpation uh, in Kabul city and also say the salaries of the oldest staff and employees of the Kabul municipality are paid and there is no problem Kabul municipality has been a very critical uh, organization since last 20 years and there was also reports of corruption from the municipality and uh, land distributions were uh, not uh, legal in most of the areas in uh, buying and selling of the properties was, which is also related to Kabul municipality were also issues related to the uh, municipality. According to uh, Maulavi Hamdullah, yeah, they will solve all the issues and they are working on this. Besides, he encouraged the international and regional donors to invest in Kabul cities in the future. And he said that's what they are focusing on and finally get the uh, 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 attention of those donors to come to Kabul because the security is much better now. And the hurdles and the security walls will be removed soon as it's already started. Family members of Afghans murdered in a U.S. drone strike have condemned America and expressed grief for their loved ones. CMG reporter Obaidallah Musa Ferzada visited the site of the attack. This is the house that the U.S. air strike attacked one day before they withdraw from Afghanistan. And in this attack, they killed at least 10 people, including children. And after 20 days, the U.S. announced that they mistakenly attacked in here. An investigation revealed the bombing did not kill terrorists plotting an attack. It instead killed aid worker Zimari Ahmadi and his family members as he pulled into his driveway. The family reflected on the tragedy and condemned the strike. We are facing lots of problems after the attack. We are in trouble. Our house was destroyed and 10 family members were killed. Now we don't even have a house. All of us are in pain. I want to tell the world that they should know about the United States and who they are. The U.S. is a criminal. They have committed crimes in every country and admit that they have done these things. I want the international community to punish the people who did this. If the U.S. is compensating or giving anything, even a White House cannot compare to a drop of blood of children. Think of the United States. They bring pain to every family when they go to any country. They have done nothing else. Voting is underway in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. 412 candidates are competing for 364 seats in the election committee. 1,450 voters have cast their ballots so far. This is the first contest under electoral changes based on the idea of patriotic governance. The election committee has two more key functions, electing some members to the Legislative Council and participating in the nomination of all candidates. Nearly 8,000 voters voters have registered this year. Hong Kong's chief executive Carrie Lam spoke to the media before polls opened. She says it's not true that the revamped electoral system is designed to shut opposition voices out of the city's political process. 
The whole objective of improving the electoral system of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region is to ensure patriots administering Hong Kong. Uh, this is a very legitimate uh, objective of any public election in any government. I, I doubt very much that uh, another government or another country will allow the public elections to their local legislature to, uh, to consist of people uh, whose mission is to undermine the national interest or the national security. So uh, that by denying, whether it is in the form of the uh, candidate uh, eligibility review committee or the uh, nomination system in the three uh, coming three elections, uh, the whole purpose is to ensure that the candidates could fulfill that very legitimate uh, requirement that I have just uh, mentioned and which has been enshrined in our local legislation. But we still welcome uh, people from all walks of life. People have different opinion about the uh, government policies to, um, to uh, go into uh, the political system. Uh, as long as we all share the common objective that we will uh, continue to succeed under one country, two systems. France has accused Australia, the US and the UK of lying about their new security pact. But the Australian Defence Minister says his country was upfront and honest with France about its concerns. Canberra has cancelled a deal for nuclear submarines that France was meant to provide. In response, Paris has recalled its ambassadors in Canberra and Washington. Meanwhile, Malaysia's Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaqub says he's worried that the pact could set off a nuclear arms race. Ross Cullen reports. Diplomatic relations between France and the US and Australia sinking to new depths as the crisis over the cancelled submarine deal continues. Now France has recalled its ambassadors in Washington and Canberra for urgent talks. I'm still confident in the French-Australian-Australian-French -Australian -French corporations. I think uh, this has been a huge mistake, a very, very bad handling of a partnership because it was not a contract. It was a partnership, a trust partnership that's supposed to be based on trust, mutual understanding, and also a partnership based, you know, on sincerity. The diplomatic recall was the first time ever France has ordered home its ambassador to the United States, its oldest ally. The move to recall the top French envoy in Canberra as well demonstrates the worsening of the situation with particular regards to the Indo-Pacific region. In a statement released late on Friday, the French Foreign Minister criticised Australia's decision to scrap its naval agreement with France. Jean-Yves Le Drian also spoke out against the announcement by Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom that they had formed a new trilateral security partnership. There's been fury here in Paris with the French Foreign Ministry saying in a statement that the decisions by Australia and the US constitute unacceptable behaviour between partners, the consequences of which affect the very idea that we have of our alliances. France has not recalled its ambassador in London though, with one senior French official saying the UK is only seen by France as a junior partner. On September the 16th, Australia said it would scrap a $40 billion deal signed in 2016 with France. The original contract would have seen French defence firm Naval Group build a fleet of submarines for Australia. But the US, the UK and Australia then surprised France by saying that American and British technology and expertise will now be used by Australia to build at least eight nuclear-powered submarines. The extraordinary escalation shows how serious the breakdown in relations has become. What began as a rippling row over a submarine contract has now become a full-blown diplomatic storm. Ross Cullen, CGTN, Paris. Coming up to 20 minutes into the hour, you're watching Africa Live. Let's take a short break straight ahead. Tunisia-Libya border reopens with strict COVID-19 health protocols. And animal prey poisoning leads to a decline in Uganda's vulture populations. The East China Sea, home of dream seekers. 
where China's hub for reform and opening up connects with the Maritime Silk Road. Whether it's exploring the busiest seaport and trade zone, or witnessing how locals strive for a better life. Join CGTN's adventure, Tides of Change Part 2. A journey enchanted by a dynamic ocean and beyond. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are these stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. South Africa's local election season is in full swing. The country's electoral commission, the IEC, is this weekend embarking on election registrations. This is meant to encourage all eligible voters to check, update and verify their status on the voters' roll. South Africa is going to the polls for the local elections on November 1st. CGT and Sulis Jamila tells us more. The governing African National Congress had all their top leaders out in Soweto. Soweto is one of South Africa's largest townships. I'm a counselor. Here, the leadership, which included the ANC President Cyril Ramaphosa, were confronted by disgruntled residents. Electricity is one of the major issues affecting communities here. Some residents have been experiencing serious electricity problems compounded by cable theft and substations that have been blown up for about two years. The issue of electricity, more than any other issue, has been the overriding problem that uh, our people are complaining about. And in many ways, they feel aggrieved in the way that electricity was cut off, in some cases for quite a long time, which is a real concern. They have expressed their anger uh, through various protests. And I felt together with the Premier and our Executive Mayor and uh, our other NEC members that we should actually go out there and meet our people and confront the problem head on rather than run away and uh, rely on uh, uh, a remote way of dealing with the problem. Currently, Soweto owes the National Electricity Power Utility ESCOM over 7 billion rand in unpaid bills, making it difficult for the power utility to improve its electricity distribution in this township. On the whole, the matter of electricity was, I think, well dealt with. And of course, we dealt with it in the end by saying that we're going to ensure that ESCOM does restore electricity the AC president is spending this weekend crisscrossing many areas in Soweto, engaging residents on different matters affecting them. Opposition parties are also out in full force trying to ensure that their supporters register to vote. In the meantime, eligible voters have begun trickling in at various registration sites across the country. Yuli Sanjameda for CGTN in Soweto, South Africa. Tunisia and Libya reopened their shared border on Friday after a two-month closure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This follows an agreement between the two North African nations to ensure that health protocols are in place at border crossings to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Adnet Shawashi reports. The new health protocol between Tunisia and Libya states that travelers from both countries have to be fully vaccinated and present a negative PCR test. All those who are not yet vaccinated need to observe a mandatory quarantine in a hotel. The border reopening is a good decision. The health protocol measures are being respected here. I showed a negative PCR test and a vaccination certificate. The only problem is the high rate of vaccine hesitancy. The vaccines are available in Libya, but many people don't want to get inoculated, so they cannot enter Tunisia. The borders between Tunisia and Libya were closed by the Libyan government on July 8th because of the spread of the Delta variant in Tunisia, 
This decision drew strong criticism from Tunisians and blocked thousands of people at the border crossing of Ras Jdir. The reopening of the border crossing is vital for business and economic activity. It also plays a social role. The border area between Tunisia and Libya connects the north to the south, Europe to Africa. I think the reopening came late because the economic activity was affected negatively. I hope it will not be closed again in the future. In mid-August, the government of Libyan Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Dbeiba announced the opening of the borders, but this decision was not implemented due to the refusal of the Tunisian side. On September 9th, Dbeiba made an official visit to Tunisia to ease tension between the two countries. Some parties tried to create a problem between Tunisia and Libya by pretending that terrorists were planning to attack our country from the Libyan soil. This is pure fantasy because Tunisia's security is also Libya's security. Tunisian and Libyan authorities are working together to boost their security cooperation. National carrier Tunisair announced the resumption of its flights from Tunis Carthage Airport to Tripoli Maitiga and Benghazi airports in Libya from September 23rd. The resumption of Tunisair flights to Libya follows the presidential decision to reopen border crossings with Libya. Ras Jdir in Ben Girdan and Hiba in the Governorate of Tatawin are the main border crossings between Tunisia and Libya. Their closure led to protests in both countries. Experts assert that the reopening will boost economic activity in both their regions. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Egyptian health ministry officials say they are in negotiations with U.S. pharmaceutical company Moderna to manufacture its COVID-19 vaccines domestically. If agreed upon, the Moderna vaccine would be produced by state-owned vaccine manufacturing firm Vaxera. Reporting from Cairo, he's Adel Mahroui. The Egyptian health ministry says it's negotiating with another international pharmaceutical firm to produce its COVID-19 vaccines domestically. Health Minister Hala Zaid is leading talks with the United States pharmaceutical giant Moderna. The government is pushing to have its vaccination manufacturing firm Vaxera to lead the production of the first COVID-19 vaccine using messenger ribonucleic acid or mRNA technology, which will then become the second jab to be produced locally in Egypt after China's Sinovac. The COVAX uh, initiative failed to achieve the targets to the 92 countries to deliver the vaccines. So uh, because we lack uh, a lot of uh, vaccines quantities in terms of contractual agreements, we need to have local manufacturing. First step was uh, uh, Sinovac, and it was a very good and important initiative that we can actually satisfy all the Egyptian needs towards 100 million uh, shots that we can manufacture. Second is we need to diversify the contractual agreements. And talking with Moderna for technology transfer is a very important step so we can have and mRNA uh, vaccines here in Egypt. The health minister held a virtual meeting with officials from U.S. pharmaceutical firm Moderna to discuss manufacturing its COVID-19 vaccine in Egypt. So far, they are still in the negotiations phase. The health minister invited the company to visit the Vaxera facility and offered to dedicate a production line for Moderna. Egypt's state-owned firm Vaxera has recently established a massive vaccine production facility that is capable of producing 3 million doses daily. It is currently used to produce the Chinese Sinovac COVID-19 jab and aims to churn out 40 million doses before the year ends. Zaid invited Moderna to send over its experts to inspect that factory and complete their capacity assessment for domestic production. Once uh, the capacity assessment is in place, will be ready for technology transfer. Usually technology transfer, it takes from six months to 12 months, but we can uh, expedite and make it faster to three months or four months if the plant is already ready. If so, and everything worked as perfect as we wish, we are talking about uh, the first quarter of uh, 2022, for example, that the plant will be ready to manufacture. The WHO has been pushing for the transfer of technology to Africa for the manufacture of Moderna's mRNA shot. But this week it reported lack of progress in talks with the U.S. pharmaceutical. Last year, Moderna said it would waive patents related to its vaccine during the pandemic. Only 3% of Africa's population has so far been vaccinated, while most developed countries have inoculated at least 50% of their population. 
The African continent is still facing many challenges to achieve the WHO's 10% inoculation target by the end of September. Realizing the need for supplies for vaccines in Africa and the potential it has in production, Egypt wants to become the vaccination hub to supply the continent with these essential jabs. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Vulture populations are on the decline in Uganda as they struggle with habitat loss and poisoning. It's a situation that mirrors a wider trend across Africa, as Leon Sinyange reports. Vultures circling above Kampala is a common sight. On the ground, they scavenge for food in the city's garbage. These vultures are among several hundred that can be found in Uganda. This is a favorite spot for scavenging birds. Just meters away is the city Yabatwa, where cows and other animals are slaughtered for their meat. Hooded vultures are a common sight here, looking for any leftovers they can find. And they pose no threat, at least according to the butchers that work around here. We are never really bothered by these birds. They stay here like any other domestic birds. The hooded vulture is one of 11 species known to exist in Africa. In the wild, their survival is increasingly under threat. The main cause is poisoning. Masai Mara, they have lost more than 90% of the vultures there because people are baiting the animals in order to kill the prey and the vultures come and, and, and feed on them and, 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 they, and, and they die. In Southern Africa, uh, the issue is also poisoning, but more poisoning because of agrochemicals. According to conservationists, over 75% of the world's vultures are slipping towards extinction. Stepping up education and community programs about the role vultures play in the ecosystem could help deal with a looming crisis. If you don't do very much, if you don't do anything now, we can lose all the birds in less than 20 years. So that's what it means and that's how, that's how critical it is that we need to start acting now in order to save these, uh, these important species. Safeguarding their habitat, experts say, could prove to be their best chance of survival. Otherwise, the big, bold, flesh-eating bird could soon be no more. Leon Sanyange, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. You're watching Africa Live. Coming up in business news... Ghana signs a $1.2 billion deal to develop its bauxite resources and Kenya's maize harvest expected to drop by 30% due to poor rainfall. This has taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. Ghana has announced that it will be partnering with Rockshore International to establish its first bauxite refinery worth about $1 billion. Rockshore will also lead the construction of a $200 million bauxite mine at Ninahin Mpasaso in central Ghana. The Accra-based company will own a 70% stake in the project and the state-owned Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development will have the remaining 30%. The state company is looking to partner with private companies to develop infrastructure 
infrastructure worth as much as $6 billion to leverage Ghana's untapped bauxite sources. The West African nation's bauxite reserves are estimated at 900 million tons with the potential to produce 10 million to 20 million tons a year. The World Bank will give Cameroon concessional loans worth a total of $740 million to support development projects in the Central African economy. The funding is earmarked for an agriculture development project in northern Cameroon, a secondary education support project, the Cameroon Chad Electricity Interconnection Project to allow the country to export power, and a women's initiative. That's according to Cameroon's economy minister, Alamin Osman May. Last month, the International Monetary Fund approved a three-year financing arrangement worth nearly $700 million with the Central African country to help it recover from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and pursue reforms. In Egypt, the central bank kept its key interest rates on hold for a seventh consecutive time during its Monetary Policy Committee meeting on Thursday. The committee retained the overnight lending rate at 9.25% and the overnight deposit rate at 8.25% since cutting rates by a total of 400 basis points in 2020 as the COVID-19 pandemic hit. The Apex Bank noted that economic activity in the North African state continues to recover from the pandemic, with leading indicators pointing towards a sustained strong pickup across most sectors. It however warned of an uptick in urban inflation which rose to 5.7 percent in August this year. And that's up from 5.4 percent in July and 4.9 percent in June. The Kenyan government says harvest of maize, the country's staple food, is expected to drop by 30 percent. The average for the long rain season harvest is usually 45 million bags of maize, but authorities estimate farmers will only harvest around 32 million bags of maize in the current period. The decline comes as the Kenya Meteorological Department expects October to December rains to be below normal levels. According to Kenya's food balance sheet, there will be a surplus of just about 18.2 million bags of maize. The government has however assured that the East African economy has enough maize stocks to cover until March next year. Poor rains have also been affecting those farming crops with short maturity cycles such as vegetables. How many Gold Mining has signed a three-year wage deal with, the, with five South African workers' unions? As CGT and Zanjil Coppola reports, it's the first time that Harmony has negotiated an agreement on its own instead of collectively with other companies under the Minerals Council of South Africa. The total average wage increase negotiated is 7.8% in year one, 7.4% in year two, and 7% in year three. It is the first time I think that all the unions actually signed on the same day. So that that is also quite uh, historical. So we are very happy for the, the spirit in which the conversations took place. And, and obviously the outcome is, 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 is a win for everybody. The Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union is happy with the wage deal. We believe that is a beginning of changing of their lives. As we have seen in the platinum sector where employees uh, have changed lives. As we speak today, in the platinum sector there is no employee who goes underground with less than 2,500 as a minimum basic salary. So this agreement pays way, uh, way, way for that also to be achieved in the, platina, in, the, in the gold sector. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa maintains that gold mining companies can't argue against real salary increases given the booming commodity prices. Well, it's been a difficult one. Uh, it's complex networking positions between us as unions. But I think at the end, we remain very focused, persuading each other. Uh, we push the company, and the fact that it gave in, it demonstrates that united we stand, divided we fall. The major union at Harmony, the National Union of Mine Workers, was excited about the wage deal and the fact that they didn't have to go on strike. We are delighted that we have done our best to unite all the labor over this. We have shown that uh, we are not greedy. Um, we can accommodate everybody where we are the majority. But uh, we also want to thank the Harmony that they've shown the, also the spirit uh, in the gold sector. They've created us a space that uh, when we go and negotiate with other mining houses, uh, they will have then a benchmark uh, with the Harmony has done with us. It's a first for Harmony, it's a first for these unions in that they dealt directly with each other and didn't involve the Minerals Council of South Africa. It seems it's come to an amicable solution and it's a three-year deal that everyone seems to be happy with.
I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Tanzania's President Samia Suluhu Hassan has launched the country's 2022 population and housing census. The launch will pave the way for a pilot census that will be carried out in 13 regions ahead of the main census next year. Data collected from the exercise will help authorities plan adequately for the country's population and its economic growth, as CGTN's Daniel Kejo reports. This is the most important data collection activity for any nation and for Tanzania the national census 2022 will be the source of primary data at the village town and regional levels the census will provide valuable information for the planning and formation of policies for the government president samia says to achieve it would need a collective effort I now call on to my fellow government officials and political party leaders at every chance they get to encourage citizens to participate in the upcoming 2022 census. Tanzania last did a national census in 2012. This time, data collection officers will digitally gather data using tablet computers instead of papers used in previous exercises. Economist Abel Kinyondo says that data will be key for a fast-growing economy like Tanzania. If you look at the data closely and you see that a lot of people are not participating in the growth, then you can have right plans and budgets to ensure that the economic growth is as inclusive as possible. You try to look around and say, what can we do so that as we grow, we grow as a nation and not in patches of certain individuals or urban centers that are growing for different reasons. So Sensa gives you all that and it points out to areas that you really need to improve if the entire economy has to grow. The census is expected to cost more than $140 million. The government is footing 95% of the bill, while development partners will pick up the remaining 5%. The launch starts with a pilot census that we carried out in 13 regions to test the data collection tools which are expected to be used in the national census next year. Daniel Kijo, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. You're watching Africa Live coming up after this short break. Cape Town in South Africa joins the rest of the world in marking World Cleanup Day. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys, the greatest sights, the greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Authorities in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, have introduced a raft of new laws aimed at controlling nuisances in public places. The new laws aim to give the local county authority the required legal mandate to ensure the city is clean and orderly. Here's Sujitin's Robert Nagila with more details. Bringing back sanity to the capital city, Nairobi. That was the reason given by the city's deputy governor last month when she enacted a new bill on public nuisance into law. It's now illegal to spit or blow your nose without a handkerchief in public places. Urinating in public is also banned, as well as selling or hawking on the streets. Motorcyclists and motorists who drive or park on footpaths will also face the law. And anyone found guilty of any of the above offences could be fined at least 100 US dollars or face six months imprisonment. But since the laws came into place, no one has yet been arrested for any offences. And as you can see behind me, many have simply ignored them. 
Many here are of the opinion that while the law is a step in the right direction, enforcement is a major issue, given that most of the people who are arrested simply bribe their way out of trouble. Robert Nagila, CJTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Ghana's capital city, Accra, is changing rapidly like many cities across Africa. High-rise buildings and ultra-modern structures are springing up all over this city. But authorities are finding it hard to enforce laws against pollution, especially in unplanned settlements that have popped up due to the city's first growing population. CGTN's Nabil Ahmed Rufai takes us for a walk around Accra. Accra is the most densely populated city in Ghana with a population of more than 4 million people. Many of them came here from other parts of the country in search of better job opportunities. The population explosion has made it difficult for authorities to keep the city clean. There are not enough waste bins along the streets, meaning there is litter in many parts of the city. According to the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, the city generates more than 3,000 metric tons of waste daily but only about two-thirds of that is collected. The city's gutters are often clogged with plastic waste and other trash. The local government has launched several campaigns to urge residents to stop polluting and recycle, but that haven't gained much traction. Ghana's president, Nane Kufado, also pledged to make Accra the cleanest city in Africa by 2020, but it still lags behind other cities on the continent. The government, however, says it is considering ways of managing the city's waste better, including recycling, but hasn't released a detailed plan yet. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CDTN, Accra, Ghana. To South Africa now, where many volunteers headed to Cape Town's beaches to clean them up as part of events marking the International Coastal Cleanup Day. With trash bags in hand and a determination to rid their beaches of garbage, they left the mother city's famed beaches looking sparkling clean. Hey, CGTN's Travis Andrews with the details. For many Cape Townians, the day at the beach is all about relaxing. But for this lot, it's all about cleaning. They participated in the International Coastal Cleanup Day, a day that's all about clearing trash from the beaches. The young and old turned up in their numbers on a day that highlights the importance of keeping the coastline clean and safe. It is very important for the young generation to know the importance of cleaning the beach. Like even with this event, we have partners that have decided to join us. Captain Fan Plastic is also very good. He's here, read, they are here reading stories for the kids, but they are also bringing awareness which is something that is interesting for the kids to also come to join us. The volunteers managed to rid the beaches of all sorts of litter, including fishing nets, plastic water bottles and various other items. Collecting the glass litter though was important to ensure the safety of beach users. We found a lot of glass lying around, which is what I fe felt was the big issue. Um, because, as you know, glass is very sharp once it's broken. Um, and especially if children come to the beach, they, have, they are at risk of cutting themselves. And if they aren't able to sanitize, infections can become a, a big problem. With around 8 million tons of plastic ending up in the ocean every year, it was one piece of litter that was collected in abundance. Plastic pollution around the Western Cape's coastline has particularly become a problem that is threatening biodiversity in a serious way. Plastic pollution is very deadly bad uh, because when the fishes and any organisms living in the ocean, they often confuse their, their food with the plastic when the plastic is washed inside the water. So, so those, when they eat those plastic, the plastic gets stuck in their um, uh, stomach cavities and then they get starved. The beach cleanup was a success. The heaps of trash collected are headed for disposal, and many people in Cape Town hope to continue keeping the beaches clean so as to protect marine life around the coastline. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. You're watching Africa Live and coming up in sports. African 100 meters record tumble at World Athletics Tour in Nairobi. How would you create your legend? On the fields, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. 
Were you born to be a player? 